Howdy, and welcome to Mean 315 lecture number 13. Okay, well, we've got um, a lot to cover, so we can go ahead and get started with announcements. Uh, first of all, homework number six is assigned and due on Tuesday, March 4th. Uh, that's available on the e-learning website. Uh, secondly, participation assessment for lecture number 14, uh, which is lecture on Thursday, February 27th, is graded and is based on this lecture's material. So uh, you need to watch this lecture, this recorded lecture, to do well on the participation assessment for Thursday's class. And then finally, project update number two uh, is due next Thursday, uh, March 6th. And a suggestion is that you start generating concepts to satisfy your solution neutral function structures, which is of course step three in the design process. And I'll be able to hand back your team update number one on Thursday, uh, uh, since some of you have some feedback that, uh, that I've provided for you in your uh, project update number one. Okay, so what is it that we'll be talking about today? Well, today is basically, uh, you know, essentially what we started last Tuesday, the Tuesday before the exam. You remember that we had this, uh, this, this large uh, block diagram of uh, basically what we talk about, uh, a large part of what we talk about this semester, where, uh, you know, we have our general thermodynamic system, which could be anything. Uh, and we can basically decompose the thermodynamic system into uh, one of two types. Uh, it's either an open system, in which case there is mass transfer, or it's a closed system, in which case there is not mass transfer. And we can further decompose each of these two systems into the type of process that the system is undergoing. So an open system can undergo a transient process, in which case the system properties change with time, or the open system can undergo a steady state process in which case the properties of the system do not change with time. The transient open system we don't study this semester. Uh, unfortunately, this is a more complex type arrangement, and so we're not able to uh, spend a lot of time discussing it this semester. For the steady state case, however, we uh, can further decompose steady state open systems into two classes of devices. There are either devices that transfer work as part of the process. In other words, they're designed to transfer work. And these would be things like turbines, pumps, and compressors. Or they're not designed to transfer work. They're designed to do some other function than transfer work. And these devices would be uh, devices such as nozzles and diffusers, mixing chambers, throttles, boilers, condensers, heaters, and chillers and heat exchangers. Uh, we're going to, this week, talk about the steady state work devices, and next week we're going to talk about the steady state non-work devices. And of course, closed systems can be split into two processes as well. We can have steady state closed system processes, so we've already talked about this. This would be things like motors and generators, or a closed system can undergo a transient process where the properties of the system change with time. And uh, a big component of the transient closed system process that we study are piston cylinders. And so we'll be talking about piston cylinder arrangements uh, after we talk about steady state open systems. Okay, so uh, steady state work devices, right? What does this mean? Well, there's basically two major types of steady state open system work devices. There are what we call turbines and expanders and these are basically devices that convert uh, energy of the flow, which would be in the form of pressure or mechanical energy, to useful work. In other words, these devices have positive work transfer. There's work transfer from the system to the surroundings. Alterna alterna alternately, alternatively, we can have pumps and compressors. Pumps and compressors use work to increase the energy of the flow, to increase the pressure of the flow. So in this case, the work transfer is from the surroundings to the system, and so that's a negative work transfer. Okay, so we, we started talking about a turbine last week during our uh, example problem, and we can just continue our discussion with that, where, you know, essentially we'll have this turbine arrangement, and we have an inlet flow, and we have an exit flow, 
and um, there may be heat transfer interactions between the system and the surroundings. Um, and because I will always draw these diagrams with the energy transfers in their positive orientation, I draw the heat transfer going into the system because that would be positive heat transfer. But you'll notice that below the Q dot, I write that that heat transfer is typically negative. In other words, uh, the heat transfer is in the opposite direction that I've drawn the arrow. The heat transfer is actually from the system into the surroundings. The reason why I draw it this way is because this is how our governing equations are developed. And to avoid any confusion when we actually take the information and apply the conservation equation, the governing equations, uh, if I draw it this way, I don't have to make any modifications to my equations. I just have to remember that if I use this equation, say the first law equation, and I get a negative value for my Q dot, it means that it's opposite to the positive orientation or that heat transfers out of the system. Likewise, if I'm given a heat transfer and I'm, I'm told that a system uh, is rejecting X kilojoules of heat transfer, then I know that when I uh, put that value into my governing equation, I have to make that a negative heat transfer uh, since that uh, is opposite to the way that I have heat transfer drawn in the diagram. Likewise, I draw the power out of the turbine, and uh, of course, I, I'm also drawing this in the positive orientation for work transfer, but of course, for a turbine, this is meant to transfer work from the system to the surroundings, so that work transfer that we calculate would uh, expect to be positive, since it's in the correct uh, orientation that the arrow is drawn from the diagram. Okay, so we have our conservation of mass equation, of course, which says that the sum of the mass flow in is equal to the sum of the mass flow out. That's pretty straightforward. Um, we have our conservation of energy equation, which says Q dot plus the sum of the energy that flows in with the mass flow rate in is equal to the work transfer plus the energy that flows out with the mass flow rate. And then, of course, our second law equation says that the uh, sum of the entropy that leaves the control system with mass flow rate is the summation of entropy that flows in with inlet mass flow plus entropy that's added as a result of heat transfer plus any entropy that's generated within the system. And of course you want to always remember that S dot gen uh, will either be greater than zero, which means that the process is possible but it's also irreversible. In other words, we have losses in our system. Entropy generation captures those losses. Or if it's an ideal process, then entropy generation will equal zero, which means that it's possible, but it's reversible or it's an ideal situation. Uh, and of course, the final criteria, S dot gen less than zero is impossible. And what we would be saying, if we ever had a process where entropy generation was negative, uh, what that is saying is that we're somehow spontaneously making energy more useful. So in other words, entropy generation being greater than zero means that we have losses in the system. Entropy generation being equal to zero means that we have no losses in the system. But if we were to ever have entropy generation less than zero, it means that we have losses in the system, but somehow they're adding energy to the system as opposed to robbing energy from the system. So it would be like saying that friction is present and it's adding energy or work energy to our process rather than taking work energy out of our process, which of course is a silly concept, but uh, to, su to suggest that entropy generation is less than zero, uh, that's basically what we're saying we would be violating the second law of thermodynamics, uh, saying that somehow we're making energy more useful spontaneously. Okay, so just like we did in our example last week, we, we have a tendency to simplify these equations uh, for very common cases of uh, things like turbines and compressors. So if we have, for example, a single flow in and a single flow out, well, then what that means is that there is no longer a summation of flow on either the inlet or the exit side. There's just one, one flow rate. 
And so we can say that m dot i is equal to m dot e. This is from conservation of mass. And we, since it's the same mass flow rate, we can drop the subscripts and just call this m dot. Now the other simplification that we'll often make is that we have negligible kinetic and potential energies. In other words, there is negligible changes in the velocities of the flow, or there's negligible, negligible changes in the elevation of the flow. So when we can apply these two simplifications, our governing equations basically simplify to the following. Conservation of mass simply says that m dot i equals m dot e, which is m dot. That's what we had written up above here. Conservation of energy simplifies to saying that the heat transfer rate plus m dot i h i is equal to the work transfer rate, or the power, plus m dot e h e. And then our second law equation says that the mass flow rate of the entropy transfer is equal to the mass flow rate of the entropy transfer into the system plus energy transferred by heat transfer plus entropy generation. The second law equation basically only simplifies in the sense that we're able to drop the summation terms from our m dot s terms. Okay, so um, you remember that we did these, uh, we, we basically came up with these examples for, or these equations for the example that we did last week. Uh, and so you could think of these equations as being developed for a turbine, but in fact, the exact same equations would exist for a compressor. So uh, I have drawn here what a compressor looks like. And now, of course, with the compressor, we, we draw the inlet side on the bottom of the compressor and the exit side on the top of the compressor. If you remember from the turbine, these two are just the opposite. Um, I still draw the heat transfer in its positive orientation going into the compressor, but typically compressors operate hot, and so they'll have a heat transfer out of the control system. Uh, and so that heat transfer is typically negative. The value is actually negative. And likewise, I draw the work transfer rate in its positive orientation, which is out of the control system. But of course, the way that a compressor works is that it transfers work from the surroundings into the system to raise the mechanical energy of the flow through the compressor. So that work transfer term would actually be negative. So of course, the difference between the compressor and the turbine is that W dot for a compressor will be negative while W dot for a turbine will be positive. The turbine takes energy out of the flow to make power. A compressor takes power to increase the energy of the flow. Okay, so if we just continue to uh, think about that example that we did uh, from lecture 11, the lecture before the first exam, you'll remember that we calculated a work transfer of 700 and se uh, 747 kilojoules per kilogram and an entropy generation of 0.1 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So we you know, basically observe that we have a positive entropy generation for that turbine that we worked in the example. And what that means is that because entropy generation is positive, as opposed to equaling zero, since it's impossible for it to be less than zero, it means that that turbine has irreversibilities in it. Right? It has things like friction, for example, in the bearings, uh, which would be an irreversibility. They represent a loss. The steam has a certain amount of energy, but we're only able to convert um, some of that energy into useful work because the other portion of the energy is used to overcoming the losses within the turbine itself, these irreversibilities. So if you remember the definition from the uh, lecture on reversibility and irreversibility, we said that an irreversibility causes a net effect on the system or the surroundings. Well, now that we're starting to study this to a little bit more detail, we can ask ourselves what that actually means. What does it mean to cause a net effect on the system or the surroundings? Well, I have drawn here our turbine example where we have an inlet flow and an exit flow. And uh, because of the energy difference between the inlet and the exit state, we make 747 kilojoules per kilogram of work energy. But inside the process, the turbine process, there is entropy generation. And as a result of this entropy generation, the exit entropy is greater than the inlet entropy. So let me ask you a question, right? 
We take steam at an inlet state, we expand it to a known exit state, and we make a certain amount of work. What do I have to do to the steam at this state, the exit state from the turbine, what do I have to do to that to return it back to its initial state, state I, right? In other words, how can I make this process reversible? How can I make the steam reverse or return to its initial state? Well, the way that we would do this is with a compressor, right? So a turbine takes energy from the flow, converts it to useful work. A compressor takes work and increases the energy of the flow. So I want to increase the energy of the steam from its condition at the exit state back to its energy level at the inlet state. How do I do that? Well, here's our compressor configuration. So we have our inlet state, which is now the equivalent of the exit state from the turbine. And the compressor has an exit state, which is the equivalent of the inlet state to the turbine, right? We're trying to return the steam back to its initial state, which would be state I of the turbine. And in order to do this, I transfer some work from the, sur from the surroundings into the system. And just for the purposes of this visualization, I, I draw the compressor work going into the control system, recognizing that that compressor work, of course, would be negative. Okay, well, let's ask ourselves this question, right? We have uh, this compressor, which is going to return the steam back to its initial state. And we can say that we have a certain amount of compressor work to make that process happen. But going in the forward direction, we make 747 kilojoules per kilogram of work energy, right? So the question is, what would this compressor work be relative to this turbine work? Would the compressor work be greater than the turbine work, right? Would the compressor work be greater than 747 kilojoules per kilogram? Would it be equal to the turbine work? Are the two exactly equal to each other? Or is the compressor work somehow less than the turbine work? Well, of course, the turbine is irreversible. So what that means is that it's going to transfer less work than if the turbine were ideal. If it were an ideal turbine, then you have no losses in the turbine and you're able to transfer the maximum amount of work from the turbine. So the turbine's work is less than ideal. So in order for the compressor to return the steam to its original state, the compressor will have to put in more work into the system. Okay. So the correct answer to my question up here is this line, the compressor work will need to be greater than the turbine work. Well, how do we know how much work energy is lost due to that irreversibility, right? So in other words, we, we now have a lost work potential because that turbine is irreversible. Well, how much is that work, that lost work potential, right? What is that? What is the value of that lost work potential? Well, let's suppose we were to treat this compressor, right? The compressor that's going to return the steam back to its initial state. Let's suppose we treat it as being reversible, such that the exit entropy from the compressor is equal to the inlet entropy into the compressor. So remember, the exit entropy is supposed to be the same as the inlet entropy of the steam for the turbine, and the inlet entropy to the compressor is supposed to be the exit entropy of the steam from the turbine. Well, because this is an ideal compressor and uh, it's an isentropic process, we can say that the work transfer that we have to put into the control system is the isentropic work transfer, which because it's isentropic, and isentropic means constant entropy, we'll subscript the work transfer term with the letter S. And so you'll notice that coming out of the compressor, I have this exit state E comma S, and that E comma S stands for the isentropic exit state. In other words, it's the exit state from the isentropic or the ideal process. And in that process, the work transfer is W sub S, which we call the isentropic work. It's the ideal work uh, associated with that ideal 
compressor process. So we can calculate this isentropic work transfer, and we've already calculated the actual work transfer going in the forward direction. And so this isentropic work transfer, the difference between the isentropic compressor work and the turbine work basically tells us what our lost work potential is. It tells us how much energy we lost due to the irreversibility in the turbine. Okay, Okay. now there's a better way to, to approach all of this, right? And the better way to do that is to just basically treat our device of interest in both an actual sense as well as an ideal sense. And when we do that, we're also able to come up with what we call a device efficiency, which we also often call the isentropic efficiency. So what is isentropic efficiency? Well, again, let's consider our turbine example. And uh, we have an initial state, and we have a given final or exit state. Okay, But what we're going to be mostly concerned about is the exit state pressure. Okay, we're not right now going to worry about what the exit state temperature is. Okay, And the reason why we do that is because what a turbine is exploiting is, ex is it's exploiting the pressure gradient between the inlet and the exit state. It's really pressure that causes the turbine to spin. And so as the turbine removes that mechanical energy from the flow, that pressure energy, it is able to convert it into useful work. And so if I were to take a flow that has a certain pressure, then what my device does is it converts that pressure energy into work energy. And so my inlet pressure and my exit pressure are my two design variables, if you will, or my two control variables. So they're fixed in my analysis. They basically represent my boundary conditions. Okay. So if you remember from our turbine example, we had the initial state, which is PI, the initial pressure, and we had the initial temperature, TI, or 400 degrees Celsius. In our example, we said that the exit state pressure was 100 kPa. We also specified the exit quality, but again, we're not worried about any other property of that exit flow except for the exit pressure. Okay, so if we now take this information, if we say we have this inlet state, and we say that we have this exit pressure, we can now ask the question, what is the maximum possible work transfer that this pressure gradient between 5,000 kPa and 100 kPa, what's the maximum work transfer that we could get from this pressure gradient? Okay. So to answer this question, let's first of all consider the first law equation. So if I write it on a per mass basis, we get that heat transfer plus the inlet enthalpy is equal to work transfer plus the exit enthalpy. And of course, when we write it this way, what we're doing is we're writing it on a per mass basis and we're neglecting potential and kinetic energies. So if I rewrite the first law equation so that I'm solving explicitly for work transfer, we get that the work transfer is equal to the heat transfer plus the inlet enthalpy minus the exit enthalpy. So, of course, we want this work transfer to be as high as possible. We want to maximize this work transfer. How do we do that? Well, first, let's consider the heat transfer. Let's consider the Q term in our first law equation. And if you think about how a turbine works, of course, the turbine is hot, right? And it's hot because it has steam flowing through it. And even though we may insulate the Dickens out of that turbine, there's still going to be some amount of heat transfer. In other words, Q is going to be transferred to the surroundings in a real, actual operating turbine. Okay? And of course, because the heat transfer is from the system to the surroundings, that heat transfer is a negative value. Right? It's heat transfer from the system to the surroundings, which is against our positive orientation meaning that the value would be negative. So if we look at our first law equation, we have W is equal to Q plus HI minus HE. And if we just consider this Q term here, well, what we're saying is that for a turbine, this Q is negative, right? So we have W equals a negative number plus a positive number minus a positive number. 
And so this Q is going to cause W to be lower than if this Q were not present at all, if Q were equal to zero. So right away, one way that we can increase the work of the turbine is by making the turbine adiabatic. We can say that the heat transfer is equal to zero. And so we then get from our first law equation that the work transfer is for this adiabatic turbine is just the difference between the inlet enthalpy and the exit enthalpy. So of course the next obvious improvement that we want to make uh, when we look at this first law equation is we want to make HE be as small as possible. Or to be more specific, we want to make the difference between HI and HE as big as possible. But remember, we've specified the inlet condition and we've only specified the exit pressure. We haven't specified anything else on the exit state except for the pressure. So what we really have control over in this analysis is how low can we make HE? Well, maybe we can make HE as low as possible. The lower we make HE, the larger this difference, and therefore the larger the work transfer, okay? So, can we make the exit enthalpy as low as possible, right? So if we draw on the pH diagram, for example, uh, our inlet state, so our inlet state has a pressure of 5,000 kPa and an inlet temperature of 400 degrees Celsius, um, you know, all we have to make sure is that our exit state is on 100 pressure, 100 kPa pressure line. So I could say that the exit state is right here on the saturated liquid line, right? In other words, we expand our steam until it reaches a pressure of 100 kPa somewhere in the two phase saturation region. And then we just continue to somehow exploit the two phase mixture and condense the steam through the turbine until finally we're saturated liquid. And I'll just say arbitrarily really that saturated liquid at 100 kPa is our final exit state. So that would make a pretty big delta H, right? HI is, you know, this value here, whatever it is, and HE is way down over here. You know, that's, that's a big delta H, which means that we would get a lot of work out of our turbine. But the question then becomes, could we make the exit state go all the way to saturated liquid at the exit pressure? Is this possible? So of course, remember that whenever we ask that question of, is it possible, we want to make sure to look at the second law. And so we can draw the same exact process on a TS diagram. And so now on the TS diagram, of course, our initial state is 400 degrees Celsius and our initial pressure is 5,000 kPa. And we have our inlet state. Uh, and then we have, of course, our line of constant pressure for our exit pressure, which is 100 kPa. And basically what we've done is we've gone from state I, expanded down into uh, until we reach the 100 kPa line, and then we continue to transfer energy out of the turbine until finally we get to the exit state, which we're saying is saturated liquid at 100 kPa. Is this possible? Can we do this? Well, actually, the answer is no. We've done something wrong in this analysis because if you take a look here, our inlet entropy is now greater than our exit entropy. In other words, our exit entropy is less than our inlet entropy. And not that that's impossible. You can, you can have a negative change in entropy of your control system if, for example, you have heat transfer out of your control system. But remember, we, we said that our turbine was insulated. So we're not transferring any thermal energy out of the control system, it's, it's a, that Q term is equal to zero because we've made the turbine adiabatic. Well, if we make the turbine adiabatic, then it's not possible for the exit state entropy to be less than the inlet state entropy. Otherwise, we would violate the second law. If we take a look, for example, at the second law equation, it says that SE, so I've gone through and I've divided by M dot to just simplify the, the equation. But SE, the exit entropy, is equal to SI, the inlet entropy, 
plus the integral of delta q over t plus entropy generation. So we've said that the turbine is adiabatic, delta q is equal to zero, in which case SE is equal to SI plus S gen. So if the process is adiabatic, the only way that we could make SE less than SI is if this S gen term is negative. And we know, of course, that that's impossible. S gen can only be greater than or equal to zero. So that process that I described up here, where I make HE as low as possible, I can't do that. I can't make HE as low as I want to. I have a physical limit on how low HE can be, and that physical limit is dictated by the second law equation. It's dictated by this equation here, where entropy generation goes to its lowest possible value, which is zero. Okay, so the way to maximize HI minus HE, right, I still have to answer the question, which is how do I maximize the work? How do I maximize that difference between the inlet state enthalpy and the exit state enthalpy uh, is to make the turbine reversible, right? So we know that theoretically we can make entropy generation equal to zero. That's possible, okay, it's not impossible. And so we'll just go ahead and say that we want to study our turbine from an ideal point of view, in which case we would make entropy generation equal to zero. So to determine the maximum work from our turbine, we do two things. We first of all make the process adiabatic and we make the process reversible. And so when we combine these two, an adiabatic process and a reversible process, we know from the second law equation that that renders what we call an isentropic or a constant entropy process. So what we've done in this whole discussion is we've actually introduced two types of analysis. We've introduced two treatments to our turbine. We have our actual turbine, right? where we have a specified inlet condition, 400 degrees C, 5,000 kPa, and we have an actual exit state, which was, if you remember from the example, 100 kPa and a quality of 0 0.9 uh, or 90%. In addition to the actual device, we also have an idealization of the device, what we call the ideal version of our device. And now, with, a, with the ideal version of our device, remember what we did. We specified the inlet state. We, we said we have this inlet state of, of 5,000 kPa pressure and 400 degrees Celsius temperature. We specified the exit pressure, right? We said that the exit pressure would be 100 kPa. That's all we specified. We, we didn't put any additional constraints on it. And we've specified the process. We said that the process had to be adiabatic and reversible because that's when we get our maximum work transfer. So we've specified that the process for the ideal device must be isentropic. Okay, so if we take a look now on the TS diagram, we can see what our two processes look like. So first of all, we have our inlet state. So this is our line of constant pressure at 5,000 kPa and our inlet temperature of 400 degrees C, where these two lines intersect is our inlet state. That's what this letter I represents. And we have our line of constant pressure at 100 kPa. And so um, we now have two exit states. We have the actual exit state. This is the exit state that is after the actual turbine device. And then we have the ideal exit state. So this is the exit state that is after the ideal turbine process. You'll notice that they're both on the 100 kPa line because they both have the same exit pressure of 100 kPa. The, exit, the, the actual exit state, though, has more energy in its exit flow, and that additional energy in its exit flow is the result of there being irreversibility in the turbine system. In other words, irreversibility, which is a loss, will dissipate itself as thermal energy. Okay. okay, so now that we have two separate devices, we can do a first law analysis for each device, for the actual device and for the ideal device. So our first law analysis basically gives us the following. 
we have our actual turbine with an inlet state, state I, an actual exit state, state E comma AC, and that turbine process, that actual turbine process, producing some actual amount of work, which is W sub T, where the T stands for turbine, comma AC, where the AC stands for actual. So we can do a first law analysis for our actual device, uh, which is Q plus HI equals the actual work plus the actual exit state. And of course, we established early on that our turbine, even you know, for the sake of this analysis, we said that our actual turbine is adiabatic, or Q is equal to zero. And so our first law equation tells us that the actual work transfer is equal to the actual exit state minus the inlet enthalpy. Likewise, if we do first law analysis for the ideal turbine, things are very similar, except for two major differences. The similar things are the fact that the inlet states are exactly the same. You notice we have state I here, state I for the actual case. Where things are different is on the exit state. So we have the same exit pressure from the ideal turbine, but because there are no irreversibilities in this turbine, there are no losses, the exit state temperature will be less than the actual exit state temperature. And so we have to specify this exit state as being that which results from this being an isentropic process. And again, we talked about this earlier. We say that this exit state, we, we label it as E comma S, where the S suggests that this is the exit state resulting from the process being isentropic or constant entropy. And of course, because the exit state is different, that also means that the turbine work will be different. And so we label this turbine work as W sub T comma S to represent this being the isentropic work that results from the turbine process. So we have now our first law equation for the ideal system. And uh, so we say Q plus HI is equal to the isentropic work transfer plus the isentropic exit state, HE comma S. And uh, I didn't mark it on here, but the ideal turbine would also be adiabatic. And so this Q term is equal to zero. And we basically show that the isentropic work transfer is equal to the isentropic exit state minus the inlet enthalpy. Okay, so now what I can do is I can calculate what the actual work transfer for the actual turbine is, and I can calculate what the ideal work transfer for the turbine is. So I get an actual work, and I get an ideal work. And so that basically lends itself very nicely to being able to calculate an efficiency, and this efficiency is what we call the isentropic efficiency. So isentropic efficiency basically gives us an idea of how good a process is relative to the ideal process. So virtually every device, we can define an ideal process for that device, and the isentropic efficiency tells us how close an actual device is to the ideal process, given the same inlet state and the same exit pressure. So the, uh, the way that we define the isentropic efficiency for a turbine, okay, which we use the Greek letter eta and subscript it with the letter S to indicate that this is an isentropic efficiency calculation, and then we further subscript it with the letter T to remind ourselves that this is for a turbine, and this isentropic efficiency for a turbine is calculated as what we actually get divided by what we ideally get. And so in terms of our mathematical terms, what we actually get is the actual work, WAC, and what we ideally get is the isentropic work, or W sub S. So the isentropic efficiency of a turbine is equal to the actual work divided by the isentropic work. And just as a small point of clarification, Oftentimes, the isentropic efficiency is also called the process efficiency. In other words, 
it's telling us how efficient the process is, the actual process, relative to the ideal process. Now, all of this discussion has centered on the turbine, right? This whole calculation of isentropic efficiency and such. But we can also do very similar analysis for a compressor with two major differences. So the first difference is that in the case of a compressor, we're not trying to maximize the work output. Instead, what we're trying to do is minimize the work input. So we want to minimize work as opposed to maximize work with a compressor. Further, uh, when we compare an ideal compressor to an actual compressor, of course, the actual compressor will have more work than the ideal compressor, which is just the opposite in the case of a turbine. An actual turbine will have less work than the ideal turbine process. Uh, an actual compressor will have more work than the ideal compressor process. So the way that we actually define isentropic efficiency for a compressor is the inverse of how it's defined for a turbine. So the isentropic efficiency for a compressor, eta s comma c, uh, in words is in the numerator what we ideally put in, what we ideally transfer into the compressor, divided by what we actually put in. And so using our mathematical terms, what we actually put in is WC comma AC. This is the actual compressor work, and that is divided by WC comma S. This is the, oop, you know what? I just realized that I made a mistake here. <laughs> and again, um, I did not do this intentionally, uh, but these two terms should be flip-flop. I apologize for that. So. The compressor efficiency, uh, WC comma S should be in the numerator. So you'll need to correct this. WCS should be in the numerator because that's the ideal work transfer. And then WCAC, the actual work, should be in the denominator because that's the actual work transfer into the system. So that'll probably be one of my quiz questions, just like I did the last time I made a mistake, just so that we make sure that we get this correct. Uh, so, uh, again, these two terms should be flip-flop and match their, uh, their word equivalents here to the left. So the isentropic compressor efficiency is the isentropic compressor work divided by the actual compressor work. Okay, so now to do this isentropic efficiency analysis, there are some standard assumptions that we're going to make, right, for both turbines and compressors we calculate isentropic efficiency in the following way. First of all, we assume that both treatments, right, in other words, treating the device as either ideal or as the actual device, we assume both treatments, both the ideal device and the actual device, are adiabatic. There's no heat transfer, even for the actual turbine or actual compressor. We say that the heat transfer is equal to zero. We assume, we assume that both treatments, both the ideal and the actual device, have the same inlet state. So they'll have, for example, the same inlet temperature and the same inlet pressure. And then finally, we assume that both treatments, both the ideal and the exit, have the same exit pressure. Okay, Not necessarily the same exit temperature, but for sure they will have the same exit pressure. And so if I now take a look at just that general scheme uh, for a turbine and a compressor, if I'm out in the superheated vapor region, for example, what my turbine does is it takes the high pressure of the flow and expands it until the exit pressure is lower. And uh, in the ideal case, that expansion occurs isentropically so that the exit state entropy is exactly the same as the inlet state entropy. But in the case of the actual turbine, because there are irreversibilities, the entropy, uh, the exit entropy for the actual device will be greater than the inlet entropy for the, uh, for, for the device. And you'll notice if you take a look on this temperature entropy diagram, you'll notice that because of the upward slope of the line of constant pressure and 
the fact that entropy is being generated, the actual exit temperature is greater than the ideal exit temperature. Okay, so again, if you remember, we said that entropy generation, or uh, we, 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 we've said, for example, that thermal energy is low quality energy, that it has lots of entropy. Well, we can see that concept in practice here, where the actual exit state of the actual device that has losses in it has a higher exit temperature. Why does it have a higher exit temperature? Because those losses, those irreversibilities within the system, well, they have to dissipate somehow. They have to, you know, we generate entropy inside the system. We have to get that entropy out of the system. And the way that it dissipates itself is by generating thermal energy. It basically disorders itself and lowers its quality. It spontaneously lowers the quality of the energy such that the uh, we're adding more thermal energy or we're adding thermal energy to the uh, to the system just one moment here <clears throat> so we're, we're we have higher thermal energy <clears throat> for the actual exit state than for the ideal exit state because the irreversibilities the losses through the system uh, basically dissipate into thermal energy Okay, or dissipate into temperature of the flow. Likewise, if we look at a compressor, so what we're doing with the compressor now is our inlet state is at low pressure, and the compressor, of course, using work transfer, increases the pressure to the exit pressure, so our exit pressure line is now at the higher pressure, and we start off with our inlet state, and we either uh, increase the pressure of the flow ideally or isentropically, in which case the ideal exit state, E comma S, is uh, exactly above the inlet state where we have the same exit entropy as the inlet entropy. Or we compress the substance, the fluid, with losses, in which case now there's entropy generation because of the irreversibilities. And the exit, the actual exit entropy of the compressor is higher than the ideal exit entropy of the compressor. And just like in the case of the turbine, be, again because of that upward slope of the line of constant pressure, the actual exit state temperature is higher than the ideal exit state temperature. And again, the way to think about that is entropy generation represents losses. It represents the lowering of the quality of energy. And so because of those losses, the exit temperature uh, is higher as that entropy generation basically dissipates itself in the form of thermal energy, in the form of low quality energy. And so the exit temperature of the actual device is higher than the ideal device because of the losses within the compressor system. So in both cases, turbine <clears throat> and compressor, the ideal exit state temperature uh, for a, a, a system that keeps the flow rigidly within the superheated vapor region will always be less than the actual exit temperature. Okay, so that's all that I wanted to cover for you today uh, in lecture number uh, 13. So where we'll pick up on Thursday, lecture number 14, uh, is to work through an example of this so that you get a sense as to how we can actually calculate isentropic efficiencies for different devices uh, using different pieces of information. But you're actually armed with enough information now to start homework number six. And so if you're able to start homework number six before Thursday, that would be helpful for you uh, since we can use one of the problems as an example problem during the lecture. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or uh, feel free to bring them to class on, uh, to class on Thursday. Uh, otherwise, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Have a good day.